I appreciate you coming back this evening for us to look a little deeper into this really important topic we began this morning. This has been uh, put together over a, a lot of study and really is very condensed. I would encourage you to take up this topic on your own and to start, especially as we begin our new daily Bible reading program, and look for all the different times that God gives warnings and shows forth His wrath and displeasure towards those who are disobedient. I've had uh, quite a few conversations with uh, my buddy Don West about this, and he's shared with me a couple of books, and uh, that has helped in my study as well. We're going to begin tonight in Leviticus chapter 26, if you'll turn your Bibles there, Leviticus chapter 26, and we're going to read uh, quite a bit. In fact, we're going to just read the whole chapter, as we did this morning uh, in the beginning of our lesson in another place we read the whole chapter let's do so again tonight i want you to see that there are basically two sections in this chapter the first section and by the way i'm using the new international version tonight the one the compilers of the niv have entitled this first part reward for obedience when we get to verse 14 you'll see another topic that's given there for the, the re- remainder of the the chapter, Punishment for Disobedience. And by the way, if you weren't here this morning, the topic we're considering is the wrath of God. Let's read the chapter together. Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves, and do not place a carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. Observe my Sabbaths and have reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops, and the trees of the field their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape harvest will continue until planting. And you you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove savage beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor. And make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have it to move out of and make room for the new. And I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your people and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws, fail to carry out all my commandments and so violate my commandment, my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring you sudden terror Wasting diseases and fever that would destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you. and You will flee even when no one is pursuing you. If after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soul will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of the land yield their fruits. If you remain hostile towards me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your affliction seven times over. As your sins deserve, I will send wild animals against you, and they will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle, and make you so few in number that your roads will be deserted. 
And if in spite of these you do not accept my correction, but continue to be hostile toward me, I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict you for your sin seven times over. And I will bring the sword upon you to avenge the breaking of the covenant. When you withdraw into your cities, I will send a plague among you, and you will be given into enemy hands. And when I cut off your supply of bread, ten women will be able to to bake your bread in one oven, and they will dole out the bread by weight, and you will eat, but you will not be satisfied. And if in spite of all this you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger I will be hostile toward you, and I myself will punish you for your sin seven times over. And you will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters, and I will destroy your high places and cut down your incense altars and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor you. I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries, and I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. I will lay waste the land so that your enemies who live there will be appalled." I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. And then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. And then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbath all the time that it lies desolate. The land will have the rest it did not have during the Sabbath you lived in it. And as for those of you who are left, I will make their hearts so fearful in the lands of their enemies that the sound of the wind blowing a leaf will put them in flight. And they will run as though fleeing from the sword and they will fall and even though no one is pursuing them. They will stumble over one another as though fleeing from the sword even though no one is pursuing them. So you will not be able to stand before your enemies. You will perish among the nations. The land of your enemies will devour you. Those of you who are left will waste away in the land of their enemies because of their sins. Also because of their father's sins, they will waste away. But if they will confess their sins and the sins of their fathers, their treachery against me and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them so that I sent them to the land of their enemies, then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sins, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. For the land will be deserted by them and it will, be enjo- it will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord their God, and but for their sakes I will remember the covenant with their ancestors whom I brought out of Egypt in the sight of the nations to be their God. I am the Lord. These are the decrees, the laws, and the regulations that the Lord established on Mount Sinai between himself and the Israelites through Moses. I want you to see the the two verses I've highlighted here on the screen, verse 11 and verse 21. We see the rewards and the blessings for those who are righteous. I will put my dwelling place among you. I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. But also the wrath for those who are unrighteous. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your affliction seven times over as your sins deserve. Now I want you to know that I have chosen one of the mildest of the descriptions I could have chosen for the terror of God. Some of them are almost too gruesome for public reading. We must sustain, as we looked at this morning, a balanced view of God's nature. And as tends to happen throughout history, the pendulum always seems to swing from one extreme to another, leaving us with an unbalanced and unhealthy view of things. And such is true in our viewpoint towards God. At some periods of history, God's justice and His righteous vengeance and His wrath and His punishment seem to be what is in vogue and what you hear and then that becomes unpopular or uh, becomes discarded and the pendulum seems to swing to the other side where God's love, compassion, forgiveness and mercy and his blessings are emphasized and such is true today in our culture. 
And people are intolerant of even considering God's punishment and His wrath. Both extremes are unbalanced. The Lord was patient with His people. He was long-suffering with them, loving towards them, sent warnings to them, pleaded with them, gave them time to change their ways, and always stood ready to forgive. This occurred over long periods of time. Uh, this is illustrated even as we think in our current times in the, the, the parable of the uh, ten virgins. A long time passed before the bridegroom came. There was plenty of time for those to prepare who were willing to prepare. But at some point the bridegroom came. The door was closed and there was no reopening it. Patience had ended. So eventually, after much pleading, much long-suffering, much warning, the time for patience for the Israelites ran out and God's righteous judgment came to pass. There is an end to God's patience. Will we heed the warning? Let's consider next Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. We'll just read the first nine verses of Jeremiah 15. If you've done any study of the kings, you will realize that the kingship or the, the, the reign of Manasseh was the final last straw so far as God's patience is concerned with the kingdom of Judah. So much so that we read in verse 1 of Jeremiah 15, Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to these people. Send them away from my presence let them go. Now, I think this is a great verse because it shows just how prominent and important and persuasive and the kind of intimacy and the relationship that Moses and Samuel had with God. It highlights that very well. And so, as Jeremiah writes here and as, as God is speaking... God is saying, even if these two who were the most persuasive in my presence, whom I had a great relationship with, who I spoke with, who I, uh, we, we discussed things, I had a, a relationship with them, even if those two prominent Old Testament people who were close to me were to stand before me and to beg for me to change my mind, it's too late. Send them away. Verse 2. And if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death to death. Those for the sword to the sword. Those for starvation to starvation. Those for captivity to captivity. I will send four kinds of destroyers against them, declares the Lord. The sword to kill, the dogs to drag away, and the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. I will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. Who will have pity on you, Jerusalem? Who will mourn for you? Who will stop and ask how you are? You have rejected me, declares the Lord. You keep on backsliding. So I will lay hands on you and destroy you. Now notice this phrase, this is, or this sentence. It's, it's quite pointed. I can no longer show compassion. I will winnow them with winnowing fork at the city gates of the land. I will bring bereavement and destruction on my people, for they have not changed their ways. I will make their widows more numerous than the sands of the sea. At midday I will bring a destroyer against the mothers of their young men. Suddenly I will bring down on them anguish and terror. The mother of seven will grow faint and breathe her last. Her son will set while it is still day. These pictures grab our attention, don't they? <laughs> it was kind of interesting. I think I kind of got a, a mixed bag of responses this morning from my lesson. It's not really one of those that you, that you leave and you go out the back door and you go, Yippee! 
And it's not one of those kind of lessons. But you know what? There are times we need to be a little sober as to the reality of what is going on. And to understand the seriousness of what's going on in the world and the seriousness of sin. And to understand and to live and to bask in the blessings that we have in Christ. But to understand the terror of God, the wrath of God that will be poured out upon the disobedient. That alone should motivate us to share the gospel. We, of course, have been studying from the book of Colossians. I tell you what, I'm not going to reread that from this morning, but I'll just go, go, to, go to the next slide. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, and in this section that we looked at this morning, there was a listing of, all the, a listing of many of the sins of man. In the same chapter where we looked at God, uh, the description of Christ and that he's compassionate, that he's loving, that he's forgiving, we also have this phrase, this sentence from verse 6, because of these, because of all of these sins, the wrath of God is coming. So if we are going to have balance in our preaching, in our teaching, in our study of the Bible, we must understand and also validate the reality of God's wrath. And to see that because of the sins of man, the wrath of God is coming. And in these verses, verses 5 through 11, we see the limits of patience. Because he says that in one day, 23,000 of them died, verse 8. They were killed by snakes, verse 9. They were killed by the destroying angel, verse 10. God's patience ran out. So here are the first two points from this morning's lesson. The wrath of God is an uncomfortable, avoided topic for this generation. The second one we looked at was the wrath of God is not wielded by an out-of-control, quick-tempered, irritable, insensitive God who delights in seeing men suffer. If that's the message you get from thinking of the wrath of God, you're mistaken. Rather, God's wrath is revealed because of His justice. It's because He's just. His just nature. And at great cost... At great personal cost. In the giving of his own son. To watch him bear our sins and to die. That's the greatest expression of love ever. Because of his love. He wants everyone to be saved. He has provided an avenue of salvation for all of mankind. His wrath is to be revealed only after much time. Much pleading and much patience. And you know what? We're going to look at tonight that people are going to misunderstand his delay in coming. They're going to say that means he he doesn't exist. They're going to say, well, because he hadn't come in so long that uh, there really isn't any wrath. Everybody's okay. But that's to misunderstand that the delay is patience. It's patience. It's a gift to mankind. Just as we looked at this morning, the the delay in waiting a hundred years before the flood came was not because God was going to change his mind, but because he was patient while Noah was building the ark and it gave an extra hundred years for people to repent. And the Bible calls it, as we looked at this morning, patience. The third point we looked at this morning, we're going to use different scriptures, or at least look at one more completely, is that the wrath of God is very terrifying. We've looked at a couple examples already. Let's look at a New Testament example from Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. This is as close as the hellfire and brimstone lesson that Steve Powers can muster up. So, (laughs) I'm not a pulpit slammer. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Now let's pause for a moment. When we read this passage, we read all that first part a lot. And we read verse, uh, we read, uh, verse 25, let's not give up meeting together, but encourage one another. And all that's completely true and validated and important. But often we leave out this section, and that is that the wrath of God is coming upon those who are disobedient. Verse 28, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God under his feet and who has treated as unholy, an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let's go back to verse, oh, no, okay, this is great. I want you to look at verse 31 here because I didn't do this this morning, but I have the NIV's rendering, the New American Standard Bible, and then the RSV, the ESV, and the New King James Version all use fearful. So let's, cons- let's compare these to get a full understanding of this concept. It is a dreadful thing to ha- fall into the hands of the living God. I like the word dreadful. That's a good one. That's real descriptive. The New American Standard Bible uses an equally descriptive word. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And also a good word. The RSV, ESV, King James, New King James, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the rich man and Lazarus rendering in uh, that's the wrong reference. But in the, in the rich man and Lazarus uh, rendering from the book of Luke. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. I believe it's Luke 16. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophets had been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jude 13. They are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. These are powerful thoughts and words. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. Now the truth for today commentary says these images are meant to stagger us. To make us gasp. And to shake our heads and say, if hell is is even more dreadful than this, how terrible or horrific it must be. The wrath of God is terrifying. Number four, the wrath of God is currently in a time of patience. It's currently in a time of patience. A good scripture for this is 2 Peter chapter 3. So let's turn there. Boy, I was so tempted to use this one this morning, but I held off. Now I'm glad. 
2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires, and they will say, Where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and with water. And by water also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be holy and godly in your lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens with fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be at peace with Him. And bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. So there twice in this this one reading, verse 9 and verse 15, this delay is purposeful. It's patience. Patience, why? It's patient for us. To begin doing the things that we need to be doing to spread the gospel, to teach others. But he's patient with the lost as well. That they will have long periods of time to be warned, pleaded with, taught, encouraged. Please listen, obey. Time's running out. God's being patient with you. The long time then is purposeful because it is God's patience being seen among us. It's not that God's forgotten, but this delay makes people scoff. Oh yeah, right, there's really a second coming. Why hadn't it happened if it was going to happen? Patience, that's why. God's patience. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 through 11. We study this in this morning's class. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Did you read those words? I circled them for you. For God did not appoint us to suffer, there's our word, we're studying, wrath. He didn't appoint that for us. That's not what God intended or wanted. His justice demands it, but He wants men to be saved. That's our job, that's our responsibility to get that word out. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, that we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. The same book, 1 Thessalonians, this time chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. They tell us how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming Wrath, there's our word again. Ah, it makes the message of Christ so much more precious. When seen not only in in the framework of God's love, which is amazing, but to be seen also in the framework of God's justice and what we're saved from by God's great love. The calamity that will come upon the unrighteous. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish. There's wrath. But have eternal life. There's salvation. 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins that deserve wrath may be forgiven. That's salvation. So during this time of patience, we must be vigorous in our efforts to rescue the lost from the impending wrath of God. I worked a long time to find that word, so you better like it. Vigorous. I couldn't find one that I really liked. So I got out my thesaurus and I looked and I finally found it. That's the word. We've got to be vigorous to rescue the lost. If you really believed and I really believed that the calamities that we have read tonight are going to be visited upon all those who reject the gospel, if we really believed it, would it change what we do tomorrow? A balanced view of God is one of both goodness and severity. Behold the goodness and severity of God. Goodness to those who love and obey Him and severity to those who ignore and disobey Him. God's wrath is to be seen through the prism of His just nature and His righteous judgment. It is God's desire that all men be saved. He is patiently waiting for the lost to be found. Now that we know what is at stake, what will we do? Will we keep silent? Here we are tonight, brothers and sisters. What are we going to do? As Bo points out a lot of times to the young people, sometimes the gospel is the, our best kept secret. And shame on us. There is an end to God's patience, and we are currently living in a time of patience. This delay is on purpose. It's on purpose that we will repent, that we will do what is right. If you think about the goodness and the severity of God, the goodness, another word we could say, is it it kind of describes our intimacy. And the wrath of God describes, in a way, our reverence. And being close to God and having an intimacy with Him is vital in our relationship. But also, being respectful and reverent to Him is also a part of our relationship with Him. And both of them are reflected in God's nature, which is just. The perfect balance of goodness and reward to the righteous And wrath and punishment for the unrighteous. All the while, pleading with the unrighteous. Begging, loving, providing opportunities for salvation. And waiting over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for people to change. But there is an end to God's patience. Will we heed the warning? If you'd like to respond tonight, will you come as we stand and sing?